The life as a physician and being involved in healthcare for most of my career has been one that's been personally exciting and fulfilling for me. And I hope that uh, you too can find a happy pathway for just the right career uh, so that you can make a difference in people's lives. So uh, I do want to hit on both of those themes today, uh, uh, healthcare as a career and our university's role in healthcare. Let me begin with a, with a story about one of our pioneers uh, at the University of Mississippi, Dr. Jim Hardy, and events that took place in his life. So our medical school was relatively new as a four-year school in 1963 when Dr. Hardy was doing groundbreaking research in transplant surgery. So our medical school had begun in 1903 here on the Oxford campus. It was a two-year school. Uh, students would spend two years here in Oxford and then to finish their medical school experience would take their last two years in medical schools around the country. In 1955, the medical school moved from here in Oxford from Guyton Hall, which now houses our School of Education, uh, to uh, Jackson uh, so that there could be a medical school that had the third and fourth year clinical components. Needed a large hospital to do that, needed to be in a place larger than Oxford was at that time to accomplish that. And so the medical school was, was moved to Jackson and Dr. Hardy was one of the original faculty members for the four-year school as it was established in Jackson. So Dr. Hardy had been doing research in transplantation for several years and in 1963 historic event took place at our medical center in Jackson. Dr. Hardy and a team of surgeons there performed the world's very first lung transplant. So they took a diseased lung out of a patient, looked into that empty chest where a lung was, uh, took a healthy lung from uh, a patient who had uh, recently died, and placed it into the chest of this patient uh, and extended this patient's life. Uh, at that time, a, a miraculous event. And we were the pioneers at the University of Mississippi in doing the world's first lung transplant. Just uh, two or three years later, Dr. Hardy and his team were also the first to attempt a human-to-human -human heart transplant. Uh, that uh, is an interesting piece of history. Uh, there were technical issues with the heart, and Dr. Hardy wound up using a chimpanzee heart to uh, implant into this patient's chest. And it was the first attempt at a human heart transplant a few years later. Uh, surgeons in South Africa uh, completed the first successful human-to-human -human heart transplant. But uh, Dr. Hardy was really an important pioneer uh, in the world of transplant surgery. So as really an interesting twist on history, on that night in 1963, when Dr. Hardy and his team were doing that lung transplant, just as they were completing the case, a call came to the operating room uh, from the emergency room. And the most talented surgeons were there with Dr. Hardy in the operating room. And there was a call for a surgeon to come to the emergency room because there was someone there with a gunshot who was an extremist who was, uh, who, who was going to, to die, uh, it appeared. And they wanted the surgeon to come and help to try to save this patient to revive this patient. Turns out that man who was lying in the emergency room dying of a gunshot wound was Mr. Medgar Evers. And that was a really crossing in history for our university. Of course, Mr. Evers was a pioneer in civil rights in trying to right the wrongs of the past, the injustices of the past around race and sadly, he died that night in the emergency room at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. But that episode on that night in 1963 defines what are two important goals for us as a university in healthcare. Uh, that heart transplant is an indication that we want to be leaders in research and in taking care of patients. We want to provide the very best health care and want to be on the cutting edge of science. And Mr. Evers' death in the emergency room that night uh, offers an opportunity for us to see the importance for us to be associated with dealing with the injustices of the past as they deal with health care. Today, there are large racial differences in health outcomes, and much of that is a vestige of the years of injustice 
around racial discrimination in our society, in our country, in, in our state. And it's an important goal of our university to be a part of improving health care for all Mississippians and to do our best to move the needle forward on solving the issues of health care disparities. Think about why is it I should consider health care as a career. Let me just offer two or three things for you to think about. Number one, health care is going to be an important part of our economy going forward. It's going to be an important part of the growth of our economy. People are going to be sick. Uh, people are living longer. The aging is leading to more and more opportunities in health care. And then uh, health care uh, jobs usually provide uh, good compensation. Now, some of you may be nervous about some of the changes that are taking place in the way health care is financed in our country and may have uh, negative impressions about some of the changes that are taking place. Let me assure you that in this country, I'm confident that people who participate in health care are always going to be able to have good compensation, they'll make good salaries and be able to provide well for their families. I don't think that tradition is going to change in our country. And then the most important reason I would hold out for you to consider a career in health care is the personal fulfillment that it provides uh, in making a difference in people's lives. It, it provides, uh, in my view, the most tangible way for someone to live a life of service making a difference in other people's lives, but at the same time be able to provide well for your own family. So let me share a little bit of my own pathway into a healthcare career uh, as a way for you to think about uh, uh, your own life. So I was a, uh, a high school student uh, who, like most high school students in Mississippi when I was growing up, wanted to be a football player. Uh, sadly, uh, God didn't bless me with speed or uh, the size I needed to be a good football player. So uh, I was walking off the practice field one day when I was a ninth grader. The football coach put his uh, arm on my shoulder and said, son, if you keep playing football, you're going to get hurt really bad. And so uh, he talked to me about choosing some other pathway for success. And he offered me the opportunity to become the athletic trainer for the football team. Now, I didn't know anything about uh, what a trainer was. He provided me the opportunity to got a little bit of, uh, uh, of an education and how to take care of injuries. And uh, so I, I moved from being an on the field football player to being one that was uh, helping to uh, take care of the football players when they were injured and hurt. I, I remember at that time uh, football shoes were not very comfortable, uh, socks weren't very good. Uh, uh, blisters on the feet was a big problem in athletes and I, I can remember vividly the, the sense of fulfillment I had in dealing with one of our star players who we really needed to play who got a blister on his foot and wasn't able to run and then after I did my little tricks with uh, helping his blister get better things that I'd learned and I saw him a couple of days later back out on the field and able to run comfortably a lot faster than if we would not had that intervention I had this sense well you know what I was an important part of helping the team win by what I was doing. It was, a, it was really a, an aha moment for me, this, this fulfillment of being able to do something about somebody's health problems that would make their life better. Uh, went on to uh, uh, undergraduate school and then the medical school. And uh, for me, it was never a love of science that drew me to medicine. I know some people go into medicine because they love science and want to apply science. For me, it was always about uh, a desire to help people. And I was good enough in science to, you know, to follow that path and to, to be able to do well enough to do that. But all along the way in my training, I always felt uh, a step behind uh, uh, from time to time. I can remember uh, after I'd graduated from medical school, my first year as a resident in we were taking care of patients who were really sick, and it all seemed too complicated for me. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it. I remember standing in the ICU at the foot of a bed uh, of a patient who was really sick, and the senior resident, who had two more years experience than me, was at the head of the bed taking care of the patient and making decisions, fast decisions, because this patient was really sick and was, was, was going to die if we didn't do something soon. And I remember watching that resident make very complex decisions and adjusting medicines and making other changes and I watched the patient in front of my eyes move from someone who was dying to someone who was stable and then went on to a full recovery and I can remember 
standing at the foot of that bed saying to the person next to me, I'll never be able to do that. Two years later, I was the senior resident taking care of a very complicated patient, very similar kind of situation, uh, just mindless about uh, doing the things that my training had taught me to do. I was comfortable by that time doing them. Made the decisions that needed to be done. The patient stabilized, went on his way to recover. And just as I was kind of finishing up uh, with the patient, I uh, overheard uh, two young resident physicians at the foot of the bed and one said to the other one, I'll never be able to do that. And it was, a, it was another great moment in, in my pathway to becoming a physician, the understanding that though the science is complex and the, the training road is long and hard, uh, most of us can do it. Uh, it's, it's something that can be done. Uh, the education process takes care of itself. And if you think now, well, I, I'm not sure I could do that. If you just are willing to be disciplined and be responsible, uh, there are lots of opportunities for you involved in, in health care. Lots of different things that you can do within health care to make lives better for other people. Well, let me uh, share a story about one more important pioneer in the University of Mississippi and our role in uh, health care professions in medicine. This is the story of Dr. Arthur Guyton. So Guyton Hall holds the School of Education is actually named for Dr. Dr. Arthur Guyton's father, Dr. Billy Guyton, who was dean of our medical school in the 1930s and early 1940s when it was still a two-year school here on the Oxford campus. Dr. Billy Guyton is a hero in his own right, but that's another story for another day. Dr. Arthur Guyton, his son, uh, did his undergraduate years here at Ole Miss and then went to medical school at Harvard. Uh, was a very, very bright and promising uh, physician. Finished medical school at Harvard and was doing a residency in surgery when sadly uh, contracted polio. Uh, lost the use of his arms and legs and could not continue his surgery residency because of his physical disabilities. He took a period of recovery and then moved back here to Oxford and then eventually was offered the opportunity to teach in the medical school and became the chair of the Department of Physiology, one of the basic sciences in medicine. Now, Dr. Guyton didn't have a degree in physiology. He had a medical degree, and it was unusual for somebody without a degree in physiology to be placed in this important leadership role. But there he was as a young man, handicapped in a time when handicapped people typically didn't work in the workplace. He was disabled in a, in a very significant way. Uh, but he took on this responsibility of teaching physiology and leading the physiology department uh, right here on our campus, uh, down in what is now uh, Guyton Hall, was housing the medical school then. In his early lectures, he kept notes, and then uh, he was using a, a textbook of physiology that he didn't, didn't think really met the needs of the students, and so he took his notes and wrote a textbook, and that textbook, Guyton's textbook of physiology, has become not only the best-selling textbook of physiology used by medical students, but we believe uh, that textbook has been used by more medical students around the world than any other medical textbook. Dr. Guyton has put the University of Mississippi on the map uh, through his writing of that textbook of physiology. Now, uh, many years later, uh, that Guyton's textbook of physiology is still being written by a University of Mississippi faculty member, Dr. John Hall, who chairs that department now on our Medical Center campus, is the author of that textbook and inherited that uh, role from Dr. Guyton. And all around the world, as medical students study physiology, they are familiar with Arthur Guyton and his name and with the University of Mississippi. Dr. Guyton is remarkable for a number of other ways uh, in his personal uh, story. He and his wife, Ruth, had 10 children, 10 children, and all 10 of those children became physicians. Can you imagine the pressure that number eight, nine, and 10 were feeling along the way after all those other children had become physicians? Yeah, so one of those 10 children is actually here at the University of Mississippi now in Oxford, Dr. Jean Gispin, who runs employee health uh, here at the, the university is one of those 10 physician children from Arthur and Ruth Guyton. Probably the most remarkable contribution that Dr. Guyton made uh, to, the, to the field of medicine was in training so many other chairs of physiology. 
So a few years ago, when there were about 120 medical schools in this country, uh, we did a survey, and at that time, there were 29 of those 120 medical schools in the U.S. who had chairs of physiology who were trained by Dr. Arthur Guyton. So nearly a quarter of the chairs of physiology teaching at that time had been trained by this one man at the University of Mississippi. Quite a remarkable contribution to the field of medicine. One last story to uh, tell you Dr. Guyton's impact uh, and uh, intertwined with, uh, with my own career in medicine. So in his research, Dr. Guyton was the first to propose the idea that in blood pressure regulation, it was not the heart that was the primary regulator, as people had thought, or the brain, as other people had thought, but he was the one to put forward the idea that the primary organ for regulation of blood pressure was actually uh, the kidneys. Uh, this was thought to be a, a, a crazy and strange idea when he first proposed it, but gradually, over the years, other physiologists have agreed, and now it's commonly accepted, that the kidneys are the primary organ responsible for blood pressure control. Dr. Guyton's research and those who followed him at our university have been the premier contributors to this fundamental idea on blood pressure control. Part of my life as a physician was spent practicing at a hospital in South Korea, and early in my time there, when I was trying to establish myself as a credible physician in another country, uh, a young patient came to me, a teenager, who had a very difficult problem with high blood pressure. Um, my evaluation led uh, me to believe that his problem was from a small kidney that he'd been born with that had been causing him to have problems with the production of a hormone that helped control blood pressure. He was producing too much of this hormone that was raising blood pressure. And I came to the conclusion that removing that small remnant kidney that uh, was abnormal from birth uh, would be the solution to his high blood pressure. But this was still in the early days of, of, of uh, believing that the kidney was responsible for blood pressure regulation. And I'll just say that there was not a strong consensus among the physicians taking care of him that this would solve the problem. And it was a risky operation and one, uh, a, a decision that I made with some trepidation. You might imagine a, uh, a young American physician practicing in another country if he made a mistake with a teenager and things didn't work out good. It could have had very difficult results for me. Uh, using the knowledge that I'd gained at the University of Mississippi School of Medicine and my, my education with Dr. Guyton, I made the bold decision to have the surgeons remove that kidney and it did indeed lead to the solution to this young man and his blood pressure normalized and he's led a a long and normal healthy life after that operation took place and I'll always be grateful to Dr. Guyton and my education at the University of Mississippi for putting me in a in a particularly strong position to take care of this patient. That fulfillment of making a decision and making a life better is is one that you have to experience for yourself to really understand and and today as you think about uh, healthcare as a career let me just encourage you to think about uh, what a fulfilling life it could be to commit yourself to making life better for other people through a career in healthcare.